When it comes to AI, I firmly believe that it will not replace humans, but humans utilizing AI will replace those that do not. G'day and welcome to another episode of The Benenberg Show where we talk crypto, business, personal growth, and shit talking. Uh, I'm your co-host Ben and Bergs, how are you man? Mate, I'm doing well, I'm excited to do this. Nice and relaxed on a, on a Saturday morning, mate. Good times. We have a fucking cracker episode, not gonna lie. We're gonna get straight into it with ChatGBT, this AI robot that's taking over the world. Uh, man, this thing is unbelievable. I've started using it, I'm getting friends, message me teachers this guy one of my one of my teachers messaged me the other day saying like he, he's creating all of his like worksheets for his students he's preparing all of his notes through ai he now all of his uh all of his students know about it they're getting their they're writing their essays through the ai robot as well like no one's doing any work Mate. just like <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable this thing has just hit the ground running it is absolutely incredible we've been using it all week our team has been using it all week we're already using it in our business and it's only been out for under a week. How incredible is that? And it's the far, I heard it's the fastest growing like software ever, like all time record. Mate, so Netflix was like four months to get to 1 million users. Twitter was like, uh, sorry, Facebook was like 10 months to get to a million users. This was five days to get to 1 million users. This is what product market fit looks like, lad. That's insane. It is Talk us through it, absolutely folks. Give, incredible. Us, give us the explain explain it to uh you know my, my nan or my mum all right so look this is just the next iteration of google mixed with a little assistant it's uh for those playing along you can go to chat.openai.com slash chat and we'll put it in the show notes and all this is is a little prompt you type in what you want and it gives you a result and the best way to describe this is i think to go through a couple of things that we've done so one of the things I love about this is it can just summarize a huge wall of text and summarize it in a few sentences. I use this all the time. And you can even say summarize it for a grade two kid or a five-year-old or someone who's been to university. So the, the first thing I did was summarize for a second grader. I went to YouTube. I got Leon's Polygon video. I got the transcript. I selected the entire thing and it's like, it's got... ERC20, ERC115 tokens, blah, 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 ZK solutions. And it summarized this huge wall of text into Polygon is a company that helps Ethereum scale. It's been very successful this year. They've committed nearly $1 billion, had 6 million new addresses, 170 million unique addresses, and 2 billion total transactions. They partner with big companies like Disney, Nike, Starbucks, Instagram. They are working on different scaling solutions. And then like one more sentence, uh, they are working to make the blockchain faster and more private. Like how simple is that? That is that is like one aspect of it, right? I also got them to summarize the Bitcoin Wikipedia page for a second grader. So Bitcoin is a special kind of money you can use to buy things online. It's different from regular money because it doesn't require a lot of trust to work. It also, it also very secure and you can use it without asking permission. Like how simple is that? So that's like the summarization aspect of it. The other aspects are you can say, hey, generate me some ideas. I want to have VR that works on a pogo stick or something like that. And it will come back and it will give you so many options. And or you could say, write me a Twitter thread on this topic, make it have 10 points. You can say, write me a poem. You can write me a, write me a rap, write me some code. It'll write code for you. And it is unbelievable. And I particularly like how the model has a memory of what you've done. So Ben, I want you to go into your example that you posted to the group and Ben's so funny. Like, so we've been talking about this all week and Ben just barrels in. This is like day five. And he's just like, I want everyone in the company to be using this right now. And he posts a screenshot and it's so funny. It was a really, so it was I, really good though, what you did. So our content creator came back and we were trying to find a better title because the title wasn't really that great. And one of our content creators asked me, he's like, Ben, you know, what's a better title here? So I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to ask, the, I'm going to ask AI. So I wrote in, rewrite a better title that captures the audience's attention. And this was the current title that I wrote in, Cryptocurrency Roundup for November, in brackets, BTC, ETH, Sol, Uni, etc., etc. It then came back and said, top cryptocurrencies to watch in November, insert, you know, BTC, ETH, Sol. I'm like, no, I don't want the asset tickers. So I said, rewrite it again without mentioning the asset tickers. And it came back and said, 
November's hottest cryptocurrencies, a roundup of the most promising digital assets. And I was like, oh my goodness. In about 15 seconds, that's taken you from like brain blockage of like not knowing or trying to think about and sitting there and like rewriting it out. I asked it two things. I asked it to optimize what it sent me before and then bang, sent that back and that, that was the new title. How good. I've used this as well where you write something out. You can't even say, write a motivational speech for my team. I'm creating a new product. I need it done by X date. Just give it a few little prompts. So the way this works is you give the AI a prompt, it interprets it and it gives you a result. And then you can work from there iteratively. And I'm like, no, make it more emotive, make it more motivational. Use these words, add some swearing because that's how I talk. And I'm like, perfect. It is, it is the tool to get you unstuck. And it can even do things like, I said, give me the top five points of the book Profit First. And it says, sure, here are the top five points. Points, calculate your profit margin, create a separate bank account, implement the four, five, it, like, it summarizes a book for you because this thing has basically gone along and eaten the internet. And I said, can you explain point three with further examples? And then it goes through. So point three was implement the four rules of cash flow, And it goes through and explains each rule of cash flow. Spend only what you have and explains it. Pay yourself first and explains it. This is incredible. Bergs, go a little bit deeper now. Like, let's 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 talk for the nerds in the of, the of our listeners and including me. How does this actually work? Like, what is this thing doing? So it's all based on text. So if you get a model and they've spent, oh, I can't remember how much it was. I think twenty million or more. I think, or maybe it was just twenty million to get it started to train this model. So in general terms, you've got this huge amount of data. And it looks for patterns within the data quite simplistically. And it now understands comprehension of the way that a human would speak. You don't have to type like you would for Google using certain words in certain ways. It can interpret it. And really all it's doing is predicting what will come next based on what it already knows. So if, you've, mm. if you're writing something like Profit First, it knows what that book is and it knows what people have written about it on the internet. And even if we expand this to images, that base is based on alt text. So you know you have an image on the internet. When you hover over it, it's got some text. This is Ben on a boat in Sydney, something like that. That'll go into a database. So when people ask it to generate that, it generally knows it'll have like, you know, 100, 1,000, a million images of that. Okay, these are the kind of shapes that I need to put in. And now I'll generate one. And really all it's doing in the background is using very fancy maths and a lot of computation to create this. What blows me away is your ability to, to talk to it though like it's a human. Write this, update that, remove this. No, don't talk like that. Add emotive language, add swear words. No, that's bad. Add five oh. dot points. Like that's unbelievable. And it's funny because you're just like, do this, do that, do this. Whereas I'm like, I'm talking to it like a human. I'm like, can you please? Like it's so <laughs> funny, man. And it's just a program. So with the book Profit First, I was like, that was great, but that's not how I learned. So I said, can you give me the top five points a profit first in the style of Samuel L. Jackson with swearing. You're a sure thing. Calculate your goddamn target profit margin. Create a separate bank account for your fucking profit. It's so good, man. This is just unbelievable. Out of the box, this thing just works. So how do you foresee this changing careers, jobs? Is it going to improve them? Is it going to make some redundant like content creators, uh, research? How is this going to affect so Different I did this for myself and I asked it to pump out a strategy for Amazon and where it's at competitors and everything. And it did it like it was amazing. The challenge with this and the challenge with every industry is you need to be able to discern whether it's good or bad. So you need to have the mm. skill already. All it does is helps you go faster because if you're green and you're like, this is great and you put it down on paper, you don't know whether it's good or bad. You don't know how to extrapolate on it. You don't know what's missing. And the very hard example I'll use is coding. So we talked about Danny Postma before and about 80% of the code that he writes is AI generated. He uses Copilot, but he knows what to write. So it's like, imagine you have, um, you're going to write an essay and you've mapped out every single thing in the essay and then you give it to someone else and they fill it out for you. That's what this is, but you need to have the framework. And when it comes back, you need to be able to discern whether it's good or bad. You need to know if that code will work, if it's secure, if it's efficient. It gets you to where you're going faster. So, and even in copywriting, <clears throat> it's not 100%, it just gets you there faster. So when it comes to AI, I firmly believe that it will not replace humans, but humans utilizing AI will replace those that do not. 
because their yeah. output will just be so much better, faster, and they'll be able to generate more novel things because they're not spending their time doing that repetitive work. So the way I look at AI is like leverage. And before AI, in my role, I have an assistant and that uh, Haley helps me leverage my time to do more important things. But I've had assistants in the past where I haven't given them the right direction. I didn't know what I need them to do to leverage my time. So if you're going into this not knowing what they need to do or not knowing how to optimize the quality, you're not going to get anywhere. Now I can optimize my assistant's time to find me the best time to, you know, uh, so I can spend in the most valuable areas of the business. Same with AI. I try to get the AI to help me write a LinkedIn post yesterday for my content. You know, it was good, but it wasn't great. Yeah. But if I didn't know the content, I wouldn't be able to quality control that and optimize and iterate it. I then iterate it to post the LinkedIn content. I, I then said, turn this into a tweet. It gave me the tweet. It was okay. It wasn't great, but I was able to get me 50, 60% of the way there. I could take it into Twitter and then make it the difference. So I think like you said, this is a combination of being able to make this bit like coming together to make it better not replacing humans but if you don't utilize this technology you're going to be outpaced and and there's going to be a far better quality created from people that are utilizing it absolutely and even things like that where you've got infill and outfill so you can write a few sentences and say okay extend on this or i've got the first sentence and last one fill in the gaps here and it will do it even things like make me a social media strategy the stuff that comes back is very generic and then you can go yeah. deeper and say okay how do i do that how do i do seo but you have to remember what the model is based on. So the, it's based on eating the internet. It's not carefully curated content of the best ones. No. And if you think about the internet, the majority of it is just shit. So you're going to get all the yeah. wrong stuff in there as well. It's like when you're coding, you're going to get bugs in your code because it's eating a resource. And on that resource, the majority of the code is not good. It's going to give you a head start. It's going to save you time, but it's not going to solve all your problems. Like for example, you know, we're trying to grow the podcast at the moment. So I typed in how to grow a podcast or how to grow the podcast. And it comes back very generic stuff. Mm. You know, oh, I'll do this, do that. Da, 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 da. It's not going to, it's not going to solve the problem of, of everything. It's just going to give you some information kicks out. I like it. like what you said at the start. This is just like a iteration on Google with, you know, you type in your question, but you don't have to go find the result. It's just giving you the the synthesized result from the data that's being given. Yeah, and you can be lazy with your questions. It understands better. I'm going more to this than I am to Google. But there is a challenge with that because Google's ranking algorithm and what people have rated and what they've actually clicked on is constantly feeding the model. Whereas with this model, it'll give you a result. If it doesn't work, you'll type something in. You're not saying that result is bad. Every time you're not like, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. You're not training the model in that way. Yeah. So there's a real challenge with this as well because the data within um, uh, ChatGPT only went up to September 2021 and then it's only select data after that. So I typed in a question. I said, is FTX safe to trade on? And <laughs> the model came, well, AI came back and said, yes, FTX is a safe and secure cryptocurrency trading platform. Hmm. It has measures in place to protect user accounts such as two-factor authentication and encryption. They also use cold storage for their cryptocurrency holdings, which prevents them from being hacked. Additionally, the exchange takes regular security audits and complies with regulations in the jurisdictions that it operates in. That's horseshit. FTX is dead. So you have to be aware mm -hmm. that this thing is just going to get you to where you're going faster, but you have to determine the direction and the path. You cannot let AI determine that for you. You still have to use your human brain for the sense check, for the kind of, common sense, the knowledge, and then you have to be like, okay, we're going in the right direction. Now do it again and do it faster or do it in this way. Yeah, it's not a solution to everything, but it can certainly assist you in getting to the result faster. But in terms of trust, yeah, that you, you still need to do your sort of checks and balances. Like for example, if I want to learn about marketing, I'm not going to go to the chat AI. I'm going to go to like HubSpot. I'm going to go to like a you know, marketing specialist, yeah. right? Or a consultant or a coach, you know, someone that's had that experience that has that unique uh, opinion or understanding of the market not the generic exactly you know obviously. And, and with this like so you kind of were asking where is this all going and this is just the start i firmly believe that we are going to get artificially generated content and i'll give you an example and this is this was thanks to danny and Bilal um on their chat as well on their pod and if you think about it now, you wake up in the morning, you've got a couple of news sites, you'll hit them, like maybe Hacker News, Indie News, Coindesk, whatever it may be, and you read the top five things. 
Google even puts that on the side of your phone. You can just swipe and it will have all the top things that you've interacted with. What's going to happen now is you can get those articles or podcasts or whatever it may be, chuck them through Whisper or whatever it takes. There's another open AI product to convert that to text because everything is based on text. You can then summarize it instead of having five hours worth of content, get the podcast, get the news article, summarize it into five minutes. Now get an AI voice to read it to me. So every morning you get your personal news feed read as a podcast to you in five minutes. That's where this is heading. Then the next iteration on that is, well, I'm AI. I know all these news sites. I know what you like. I know what you interact with. I'm just going to generate the content myself. So you have AI generated content delivered to you. So you'll get individual news for yourself. And that's, that's what's happening now within the model. There's a base level model, but when you interact with it, the model changes and it has a bit of a memory. So if you start typing things in your model, it'll be different to mine because the inputs will be different. So you're all getting different results. It's just such a fascinating thing. And look, we're already using it in our business. We use it for our content. We use it to summarize. We use it to fill things out. We say, hey, grab this content, make a 10 tweet thread. And that just helps us get unstuck. You don't have to start right at zero. You're starting at like 50. It just makes things a lot smoother. And mate, it's brilliant. Mate, I'm going to end this with, this is cracking. This is shout out to my boy, Joe. Lad. So he gets on there, right? And he's, he's a software engineer. Like the rest of them, he's fueled on coffee, depression, and rage. So <laughs> he writes in, can you write an excuse? This is to AI. Can you write an excuse to why there were bugs in my code in the style of Donald Trump? And it comes back, the bugs in my code are fake news. I wrote the greatest code in the history of code. Believe me, the best code. And these so-called bugs are just an empty attempt by the dishonest media to make me look bad, sad. <laughs> how good, how good. And my dodgy Donald Trump voice. And then he asks it, can you do the same, but in the style of a slightly depressed developer on cocaine? <laughs> so he goes, there's bugs in my code? Yeah, I don't even know. I was up all night working on this thing, pounding back the caffeine and coke, trying to make it perfect. But somehow, somewhere, the bugs crept in. I'm not even sure how it happened. <laughs> I'm just a tired, depressed developer on too much cocaine trying to make it through the day. <laughs> and then and then he goes, can you make it more depressing in tone? And he goes, the AI goes, sure. Like there's bugs in my tone and my code. They're a reflection of my life. I'm a failure. I can't even write a simple program without introducing mistakes. I'm just a miserable excuse for a developer stumbling through my days in a fog of depression and self-loathing. The bugs are just a symbol of everything that's wrong with me. <laughs> and he replies, perfect. <laughs> How good. Like, oh, oh my God. It is so, so next level. It is just amazing, mate. Oh, brilliant. I love it. I love it. Technology. And Technology. Look, we're going to keep using this and we'll keep everyone up to date on how we're using the tools we're implementing. Oh, and Zapier just announced that you can now use this as a zap. So you could literally connect this to Slack. You could connect it to WhatsApp, Telegram. So on your WhatsApp, it's like your yeah. own personal assistant. You could just ask it questions and it will reply. So you can now integrate this. You're starting to see this with Notion and a few other products, integrating AI as a service, like on top of their existing product. So we're, I'm pretty sure we're going to do that this week. Have it in Slack, just have a channel where you can ask it questions. You don't have to go to a website. Going to be amazing. Oh, that's super and cool. wait, we've got one more example. People have been using this in, in magical ways. And one guy, he's a, um, own, I think he's a business coach. And there's a guy that owns a business. I don't know. I can't remember what it is. It's something like a plumbing business, something like that. And his um, spoken English is quite good, but his written English is very, very bad. So he went, he set him up with a basic WhatsApp, uh, sorry, an integration with Gmail and chat GPT. And the guy types in um, like mail Marie, send to like it, you couldn't even understand it and it was basically yeah. uh send an in, uh send a quote to them or something like that and it wrote dear dear marie thank you so much for blah 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 kind regards and this person's name and he was actually able to close multiple deals actually no it was i think it was a different role it wasn't a plumber but he was able to close multiple deals because his english was so much better because of this one little thing and he never would have been able to do that over email previously. How incredible That's is that? That's awesome, man. That's really nice. So good, mate. Uh, technology, man. Um, speaking of 
uh, like leveling up and efficiency, productivity. There's been a couple of things. I think I mentioned on the pod before about reading and consuming the audio at the same time. I think we've spoken about this on the Is pod. this the Ben, ben def- read a book segment? This is the Ben has finished a book oh, segment. Oh, well done, lad. And, and not just, just finished it, like not just sort of like stumbled over the line, like just thrashed it, mate. Why are like, you like this every time? It's like people want to be rewarded for reading a book. It's like, I didn't just read a book. I fucking smashed it. Mate, if there was an Olympics of reading a book, I would get a gold fucking medal. Yeah. <laughs> no, mate. I, no, I'm like, you're saying on this new strategy, mate. I'm like, mate, I fucking threw that thing down. Like, I just picked it up and just threw it down. 140 pages, mate. 1.5 speed audible. Yeah. Consuming this book like an absolute degen and just flew through it. And my consumption of content was unbelievable. Like, Seriously, man, this is a game changer. Uh, I don't know what else to say. You, have you tried it? Have you done it? No, yet? I haven't done it yet because unlike you, I can actually read and my comprehension is quite good. <laughs> but no, honestly, I, I probably would. I probably would try it for reading that I struggle with. But you came to a meeting yesterday, and in this meeting, you were like, "Oh, I read this book, and this is what happened. Oh, and like this is what it says next in the book. Like your comprehension of the process." was insane. You were just throwing everything down. And normally people will read a book, they'll take away a couple of points and then move on. But your retention and application and knowledge of the book was next level, like you'd read it, read it four or five times already. Yeah, man, I, I generally like I've never experienced anything like it. Um, it's, it's, it's hitting different parts of the brain and just that saturation of knowledge uh, was really, really fascinating. So anyway, I've, that's one. The other one is delegation and outsourcing. Yay! So I'm happy to hear you say this, I've, mate. I've done a thing, Bergs. I've outsourced a thing. Look out. Recently. I've outsourced I've, I've outsourced a lot of things. I've I've come to the conclusion that I am not that smart. I'm average. But I bring smart people in to do certain tasks to make the product life whatever better. Yeah. Um I've been single for a little while now, Bergs. And I'm not looking for, you know, anything too serious, but loaded up the old Tinder the other day yeah. and I was Here like, we go. oof, oof, this is a, this is a bad looking profile. This needs, this is, this is ugly. Sort of sat there, sort of looking at my photos, look at the bio going, oof, this is, uh, this is ugly. This is not good. I don't even know how to write a bio. So what did I do, Bergs? I found a Tinder expert. Oh! I went to, I went to Fiverr. All right. Found a Tinder professional who used to work at a, at, it doesn't say she was used to work at a like a dating app company so she knows the algorithms she knows the photos she knows what works she knows the bios she just sent back so what i had to do i had to send through like a list of questions she had a list of questions i'd answer them what i'm looking for like who am i personality send her all my photos berg she came back with uh basically like a three-page document of you know notes and files about like the strat, my strategy basically that I need to use based on the algorithm. Oh she gave me my bio and she gave me photos, right? Photos edited back in the order that it needs to be delivered based on, again, the algorithm and different psychological tendencies that women look for in photos. So good. So good. All right. Uh, Mate, this is, yep, this yeah. is incredible. <laughs> so have you watched a show on Netflix called Casual? No. So the premise of this is a guy invents a dating app. It's essentially Tinder. And on his profile, he's honest and he hasn't had any hits in two years, but he's got access to the data. So he does the exact same thing where he writes, I like dancing. I like this. I like that. The way he displays his profile pic with like a girl that's like a 10 out of 10. And it's just like he goes through the psychology. And it's an amazing story between him and his sister that had a very bad upbringing. They're pretty much both sociopaths or psychopaths. Um, they just don't care and but they eventually become you know human over the series like they learn a lot about themselves but just that insight of and he goes on these dates like the first episode is incredible he goes and sits down with this girl because he's just having casual meaningless sex because that's just you know yeah it just helps his life make sense so he goes and sits down and she's just like this the first scene is like in a restaurant and the waiter comes up he's like oh we've got this like um I don't know, trout with like lemon butter and lemon myrtle and this. She's like, Ooh, that sounds fantastic. But I'll have a bunless burger. And he's like, all right, I'll have the trout. And they're like, there is only two left. 
And he, he asked her, he's like, why? And she's like, oh, it's not paleo. He's like, trout. They didn't have trout in the Paleolithic era. He's like, no, they didn't have lemon myrtle butter. And he's like, okay. And she's he's like, you order the burger. He's like, yeah, the burger's really healthy. It's like bacon burger without the bun. She's like, you know, the bun's unhealthy. He's like, pretty sure that's not true, but I'm willing to move on. And then like, it just goes like, it just descends into madness from there where she's like, a guy at CrossFit told me, he's like, oh God, just starts drinking. And it was just, it was just absolutely hilarious. And they, they are such bad people, but back to the algorithm and how this works, mate, you have to do this. You have to keep us updated. And these, these are the data okay. points I want to know. So you would know what your previous, I guess, dating success rate was. So yep. of every, let's say, 10 that you swipe on, how many would actually yep. slide into your DMs? How many would actually go to have a date with you? And then you could judge overall quality, whatever that means to you. So previously, and when you up your game, okay. this is huge. Because okay. this, this is really, because what you're doing is you're leveraging all of this data and then you're applying human psychology to it and you're wrapping it in a nice bundle. So when someone's on their phone, they're at home, you know, they're looking for a, a partner or a hookup or whatever, you've got exactly what they need to give to hit that thing in their brain to go, yes, this guy. And I want to see how well this worked on Fiverr. Hang, hacking the system. By the way, quick disclaimer, I'm not catfishing. This is all my photos, all my bio. I'm not like saying I'm the bloody president, but this is like just optimizing and using language and the strategy of what photos and how, I oh mean, this is like a three, I can't read all this stuff out because it's, it's honestly just But like, this is what we do um, every day, but we do it for resumes. We do it for CVs. We want to put our best foot forward. I know I'm good at these things. How do I explain that to someone else and come across the way that I feel in my own head? Okay. I'll read you out the reason why we're using this. I won't show the photo because I don't know where it is, but I'll read you out the reason why we're using this photo. I want to switch, this is what she said to me. I want to switch your lead photo to a posed work headshot in a black t-shirt. This is the strongest photo available that you've sent me. This is in good lighting with bounce on your cheekbones and smile and a deep shadow under your face highlighting your strong jaw and chin. You got, a, you got the weakest fucking chin. Anyway, we'll move on. We also have <laughs> we also have shadows on your neck, muscles, and Adam's apple, which hint at a muscular physique. I've done some minor retouching this photo to brighten up the light on your face. I want you to have success. Make sure you center this when you upload it to Tinder so there is no dead space above your head. Dead space can create a negative reference for your height. Oh my God. That's just photo number one. That is incredible. <laughs> How much does this type of thing cost, mate? Like, I don't know. Like, 150 Oh, mate, that is so cheap. Bucks. I was thinking like thousands. That's incredible. No, like 200 bucks. Yeah, it's great. This is insane. So let's up frame this to a bigger thing. One thing that you do, you said, you know, you weren't very smart and I agree with that. And then... <laughs> I've always... Actually, can I just let pause? Let's just pause the pod for a second, right? Pause. We caught up with Crypto J, uh, one of the listeners. Shout out Crypto J, absolute legend. Collective Shift member, been a Bergs fan. And you know what he says to me, Bergs? You know, catch up with the first time I met him. He comes to a beers, he goes, that fucking Berg bike, mate. Fuck, he gets into you. Every episode, he's just into you. I said, I know, mate. I'm the nice guy in the pod. I'm just keeping things moving. I'm just like a, I'm like a sponge, just copping it all the time. And he's like, yeah, I know, mate. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you put up with this shit. See, you play that role really well, but you're a real C next Tuesday and you're paying the ass to work with, mate. <laughs> Honestly, you're the worst. But seriously, no, for someone your age, you are, you are smart. But in terms of what you do that makes you successful is you keep iterating. You say when you don't know, and then you get a team of experts around you. And the experts is what I want to focus on. People are very reluctant to spend money, but you're like, I want to get fit. I hire a personal trainer. No, no, that's not good enough. They show up to my house at 6 a.m. They knock on my fucking door. So I have to go and do the exercise. Right. I have to do this thing in the business. I've never done it before. I hire an expert. I want to get good at Tinder. I pay $150, which is incredibly cheap. Could you imagine trying to do all that yourself? And now it's done for you. With the ROI, I'm not good at it. I don't want to do it. I fucking hate doing it. I actually hate being on there because it's just such a pain in the ass. You have to fucking talk to people and do all this sort of stuff. Like, I just don't want to do it. So just outsource it. Like, in Yeah. I, I don't know. Some people... Yeah, I don't know. I think it's... Like, some people I speak to, maybe some of my friends, like, like they'll they'll listen to the pod and call me an absolute fucking fruit loop for doing this. But I'm just like, fuck it. Like, I'm going to get better results. It costs me $150. I don't have to do any work. And I'm going to get, like, matches and stuff. And I don't have to do anything. This like, is... The how is that this is the thing do you want to spend the time up front or do you want to waste heaps of time 
downstream. So if you're looking, let's say you're looking for a relationship, right? And you're like, I need to convey exactly who I am for a relationship. If you did that yourself, because we are very bad at mediating our own thoughts as humans. Mm. If you did that yourself, imagine the amount of dates you go on, second dates, third dates, and it wouldn't work out. Whereas if you could find um, a better match earlier on and increase your you know, surface area for luck or chance or success, why would you not spend that little bit of time up front instead of heaps of time downstream? Exactly. Mate. Like, I don't want to go and... Like, it, it just makes all the sense in the world. Like, I love outsourcing, man. Anyway. It is so good. And it is so cheap. Oh, People you know, don't realize how cheap it yeah. is to outsource things. And they don't realize how cheap it is to hire a professional until they've hired an amateur. Because you've got to pay twice and, and it doesn't work. Correct. And what do you get on the other side of that investment? Okay, it's not just $150 or $150. It's like, no, what is that going to get you? It's going to get you saved dates, like in terms of meeting with people that are not your match. Um, more match, so more volume. You don't have to sit down and write it and do a shitty job of it. Uh, and like, already that's like, you know, unlimited, you know, in terms of the you know opportunity, yeah. there, right? Versus the, the cost. Exactly. So and if you equate that to how much that costs, that's like, if you're working, depending on how much you earn, it could be one to five hours of working. Is spending that yeah. five hours of time to get that $150 worth it? Yes. Because how much are you going to spend downstream? Way more than five and, hours. Correct. And you're not even an expert in that area. So you're going to do a shitty job of it and spend longer. Why do we think we're experts at everything? I'll just give it a crack. I'll do it myself. Don't you think that's crazy? Like, would you go and just like, like oh, I'm just going to repair my car? Oh, I'll, I'll just I'll just get in there and I'll just service my car. No worries. Like what? You, first of all, you don't even have the tools. But because something is like, oh, it's just writing and it's just on a computer and I have one of those, I should be able to do it myself. No, it's a whole skill. It takes years and years. There's so much experience that goes into it. Yes, people might be able to do it quickly, but there's 10 years of experience behind that quickly. It's like crypto. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm an expert. I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy that, that old coin. I know oh, yeah, I've, I've got an app on my phone. I'll just buy it, mate. Yeah, everything's going up. No worries. Fuck, I'm rich. Like it is that that is exactly I'm a I'm a Next I'm minute. a trader. I'll get into it. We've all been there. I've been that. I'm a trader. Yeah, awesome. I'm a, I'm a trader. I'm a crypto oh, trader. Oh, mate. And the amount of effort you have to put Next. in to actually be Wrecked. good or successful. And this is the other thing. Think about it in this way. We'll use trading as an example. You're a new trader. You're just learning. Think about who's on the other side of the trade. People that have been trading for ten or twenty years. Who are you competing with? And if you're buying or selling, who's selling or buying and why? Now let's frame that to Twitter. You're competing with people that go to Fiverr, that get the experts or are experts themselves. Why would you not want to be in the top 5% of Twitter of, of um, Tinder profiles? Why would you want to be in the bottom? Why would you not just get the experts to help you? Be the best you can be. 100%. So good. Especially when an absolute 5 out of 10 like I am. You need all the help you mate. can get. Same with you, Bugs. If you were single, mate, I'll be, I'll be ripping mate, that, I'll be getting this stuff for you. fucking head. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus, you better get some sideways profile pics so I see those ears, mate. <laughs> All my photos are just behind me, <laughs> mate. You're lucky. You're lucky. You're you're a top bloke, and you're actually a decent bloke, and you're good to have a conversation with because you got nothing else going for you, mate. Well, mate, I appreciate that because I actually I actually sent her a photo of you and I, and she said, mate, you can't use that photo. Oh, hey, no, yeah, yeah, don't send a photo of me. What's wrong with you, mate? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Speaking of. I just really got nothing to do with anything we're talking about then. But, mate, I had an awesome conversation with uh, Gami. Gami, have you pronounced that? Gami is a nouns owner. And uh, I, I know him him personally. I won't, I won't dox him. Uh, but Gami is a... Uh, he owns nouns, uh, nouns 189 and nouns 401. So nouns is a NFT. Um, and it's part of the nouns DAO. And this was a really fascinating conversation, Bergs. Um, first of all, for those who don't know, um, do you want to give a little brief explainer what a DAO is? You've worked in DAOs before. Oh my God. Wait, you, you're like, can you explain AI? Can you explain DAOs? It's like, can you explain rocket science? We well, do nothing else on the, what else, what else you roll oh, in this pod, mate? You do nothing Jesus else. Christ. Mate, the reason you met this person is because you pissed off to Sydney and you were on a couple of boats, mate. That's, they, look, come on, let's be honest. Drive with giant big wheels, mate. I don't know how they let you, buddy. <laughs> Ben's got this photo on just, his Twitter just, and this wheel is ridiculous. It's like two meters wide and it looks like a kid. You know, you let your kid drive the car, mate. That's what it looks like. You fucking mean, just explain it down. All just right, do so DAO stands for Decentralized right, Autonomous Organization. 
And what this is, is a group of people on the internet that come together and generally for a purpose and they have some assets attached to it. The easiest way to uh, example for this, I think was a constitution DAO. A group of people got together, they wanted to buy the US constitution. So people put a bunch of money, a bunch of ether into a fund. They received a token in return. And based on that token, it was kind of like you had voting rights and things you could do potentially an ownership stake. That's an example of a DAO. In the exam, do you want to go through and explain Nans DAO? Yeah, okay. I'll go and explain Nans yeah, yeah. I'll let, let me yeah. just say a bit more about DAOs. So yeah, they are called decentralized autonomous organizations. Decentralized because they're all over the world. Autonomous because they're kind of self-operating and organization, a group of people. The problem with DAOs is a coordination problem. They're very easy if you've got, say, a, a bounty. I've got this bug. I want you to fix it and the community can vote for it. Or we're going to put on an event. What do you want the event to look like? And you vote with your tokens, however many tokens you have and ownership state, you can vote for it. The money goes from the treasury and they execute on it. They're generally the things that DAOs are good at. They're right on the other end of the spectrum compared to a normal, highly organized company or government. And that's probably the best way to think about them. Amazing. Now, now it sounds a little bit hard to explain because the reality is that they're still figuring it out themselves, but it's a really cool concept. So... Uh, on their website, Nounstown explains themselves as one noun every day forever. So nouns are an experimental attempt to improve the formation of on-chain avatar communities. So on-chain avatar communities like PFPs, where you have unique profiles that live on-chain on Ethereum uh, or any blockchain. While projects such as CryptoPunks have attempted to bootstrap digital community and identity, nouns attempt to bootstrap identity community governments and a treasury that can be used by the community so the most fascinating thing about all this bergs is that there's a right now there's only about 500 nouns or 537 actually no actually there's only 536 until they mint a new one and every day they mint a new noun so at the time of recording they basically uh, go on an auction, a 24-hour auction. So nouns 537, the new noun that is going to be minted, the auction ends in six minutes. So there's the current latest bid is 27.82 ETH. So that's 27 ETH per day they're minting these at. And that money goes into the treasury. So currently NounsDAO has over 29,000 Ethereum in their wallet that's open and very transparent that's over 34 million us dollars in their treasury and the community has the ability to use that treasury to build whatever they want basically so the nouns dow uses a governance model uh to utilize a hundred percent of the treasury so a hundred percent of the ETH proceeds from that daily noun auctions to vote on different things and do different things with yeah. it, basically. So, uh, and uh, this is interesting, you know, right? Yeah. So, just yeah. doing quick maths on that, the floor price, so the cheapest noun you can get is 39 ETH, which is about 75,000 Australian dollars, is the cheapest one you can get. With the amount you set in the treasury, if you divide the amount by the amount of nouns, that's 54 ETH. So, you're buying at 39, and you essentially have a 54 ETH stake within that. So already they're setting a price there, which is phenomenal. And you get to control that. And there's only 500 people in here. It's a close-knit community. You guys chat all the time. You obviously have wealth because they're worth 75 grand minimum each. And for those that haven't seen it, these are the red kind of like iconic glasses that you see. And really you're creating an elite group that can vote and deploy and allocate a serious amount of capital. It's really exciting. So there's been over 160 odd proposals. Uh, and basically, I think the way Gami was explaining was that, that I think 10% of the total DAO needs to vote for a proposal for that to go through. So you need to basically put a proposal up to the DAO with what you're wanting to do and they vote on it. So you can vote for, against or abstain. Now, as an example, uh, one of the proposals that got approved a couple of months ago was to sponsor NFT Fest. So uh, they proposed that they'd spend $25,000 of their ETH on uh, 22 ETH 
for NounsDAO to facilitate an in-real-life activation and be the official sponsor of NFT Fest. They had 180 votes for, zero against, three abstain. Perfect. So this went through. They had the 22 ETH and they could sponsor it. Uh, other things are like building media brands. So they've actually bought they bought a studio, an agency. They bought a, bought a marketing agency and turned it fully into a fully-fledged Nouns Dow agency. So they've got like a team of eight people working full time and creating media and content for Nouns Dow. So they're wanting to be, I think, some sort of media, some sort of like, uh, you know, just renowned known brand in the future. But even the founders, I think, have said, like, we've got no idea what this oh, is yeah. going to be or what's going to be. Yeah, it's cutting do. edge stuff. We're just here to do yeah, shit. Yeah, and you have to fit yeah. within the current uh, legal framework as well. So even though you're a Nouns holder, you get to vote on deploying capital. And that threshold is very low, 10%. This also tells you that people buy things and they don't, they're not involved in voting at all. Like in no shareholder meeting would you say only 10% of shareholders need to vote to pass this. It'll be over half or you need the director's involvement, things like that. And we also need- So one of, the, oh, sorry, oh, one of the other fascinating things is I think there's two founders and they have, so every 10 nouns that are minted, they get the proceeds of, of one so nine go into the treasury one go into they basically get it every 10 so they've actually got i think like 50 nouns each so theoretically anything that they vote on for or against would supersede everyone okay. else so you know there's still that that sort of founder's ability to do that it's fascinating i even thought i, I spoke to him about like are they worried about the supply and demand you know with you know increasing one you know the, you know increasing the supply every day but it was sort of good feedback. I think it was, it's going to take them something like 20 or 30 or 50 years to meet the amount of NFTs that Board Ape have. Yeah. Board Ape, your club, have 10,000 NFTs. They've only got 500 right now. So That's exactly yeah, right. Fascinating. And we also need to recognize that although you're buying something for a minimum of $75,000, you do. I'm assuming you do get some other benefits with it as well. You can vote on how to deploy that capital, but there'll be some kind of structure in the background like, a company or whatever it may be you don't have shareholder rights in that company you don't have equity in that company you don't have voting rights you just have an asset so it's not assets and nfts are not equity it's not equity in a company um i haven't seen one a model that that does that i have seen ones that have failed that that don't work too well because it's very hard to manage and the legal framework is just crazy like you wouldn't run a company like that but what you are getting is an alignment with a company and a business model where you can benefit from it. And that is an, a new noun is minted every day. It's like roughly another 40, 50 ETH that goes into a pool that you control. And that's the relationship and that's the incentive alignment. So it's cool, man. This is like probably one of the cooler mechanisms of a DAO I've seen. I mean, just to see how much money they have too and all that money going back in the treasury. It's just like this self-fulfilling our community that can use the money that they invest in to do cool shit with with a brand it's pretty awesome and it'll see we'll see what they can buy what they can do there's obviously demand there is demand every day um i'm curious to see what how that demand reduces once supply increases because that's the general rule of how things work but the supply is so low and the funds have expunged are so low as well that it's incredible mate i'm gonna cool. tell you a story so this yep. is my dentist and the sales strategy of my dentist. And I love this. So this is just like a offline business run by a little family. So the the dad, who's he's an older bloke. He'd probably be in his like 60s, something like that. No bullshit kind of guy. Great guy, Indian guy. His wife uh, mans the front desk. And then his son is also a dentist that works there. And they've got a couple of like assistants that help them. So I go in there the first time. Sign up, you know, really easy kind of process. You know, they're no bullshit. It takes a couple of minutes. Very small place. And first thing she asked me, how did you hear about us? And I was like, oh, these guys are good. So like I tell them, oh, you know, my mom recommended you. You guys are really good. You know, you, you don't stuff around. Like, oh, great, great, great. You know, what do you need done? Okay, here you go, straight in. <clears throat> Get some stuff done. Great. Hey, man, like it's every six months, but we don't need to see you for a year because your teeth are good. That's fine. Come back a year later. Oh, you know, there's like a couple of holes there. You probably get some feelings next time you come. You don't like need like injections or anything. We'll just do them. They're really small. It's just preventative stuff. We'll just do it for you. This is how much it's going to cost. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, great. This is how much your HBF covers. Now it's a year later. So they started calling me on my phone, right? And usually you get the call up and you're like, 
oh, you know, it's a yearly call, you know, this kind of thing. So they call me. I see it's the dentist. I don't pick up. Immediately, they call me again. I don't pick up. Immediately, they call me again. Like three calls in a row. Who does that shit? And I'm thinking, fuck, is something wrong with my teeth? Like, do I need to go back? Like, I'm like, no, these guys haven't (laughs) seen me for a year. My teeth are fine. They got no results. This is a sales strategy. I'm not doing this shit. And I'm like, fuck it. I'm busy. I'll do it later. Like, dentist is always later. I don't care. My teeth are okay. A week later, call me again. Don't pick up. They They don't leave a message either. Right? This is the strategy. Call me again. And again, three times in a row. Don't pick up. Two days later, they send me a text. You've got an appointment booked with Dr. Whatever Face at this time. This is your appointment. And it's like, reply no, otherwise your appointment goes out. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, they God. just booked it. How good. They just booked it. Like this company, you very rarely see, especially with like offline old school businesses that have a proper sales strategy that someone is executing on to get customers in the door. Like the majority <laughs> of people would be like, because I know what's going on, right? First of all, I'm like, fuck you. I know what you're doing. I'm going to go there anyway. But in my own time, fuck them. They're not telling me where to go. <laughs> so I know what they're doing and I'm mentally tough enough to be like, nah. But the majority of the population would be like, holy shit, I need to go back. I'm feeling guilty about my teeth. I didn't answer three times. It's going to be serious. And I guarantee you when you pick up the phone, they'll be like, oh, you know, your HBF is here. You need to use it this calendar year. This is like all these incentives for you to basically go down there. I just thought this was brilliant. And more people need to go harder at sales because this is how you survive in current market conditions. This is amazing. I love so, it. So, so good. A few, few lessons left for us. Oh, learn. mate. Hey, I just, I wanted to circle back just as we're talking about business on the amount of layoffs we've had this Ooh. year. I've done a little bit of, you know, done a few calculations, mate. You've done so the maths, have you? Did you get your calculator out? I've done the math. You've done the math? I've done the, I've done, done some, I've done some Berg. So, so my calculations, approximately 15,000 people have been laid off from crypto companies in 2022. So FTX, 100%. BlockFi, 100%. SwiftX, 40%. Bybit, 30%. Kraken, 30%. Crypto.com, 30%. Hallby, 30%. Dapper Labs, 22%. And OpenSea, 20%. Absolutely massive. But it gets better, Bergs. Well, worse, however you want to look at it. Tech companies across the board have also been cutting back their total staff. So all we're seeing is crypto's over, it's dead, we're going to zero. Meta, previously known as Facebook, 11,000 people. Amazon, 10,000 people. HP, 6,000 people. Twitter, nearly 4,000 people. Salesforce, 1,000 people. So the people that are calling the end to crypto forget that the rest of the world is also struggling in terms of technology and uh, the economy, rising inflation rates, everything else is struggling. We're heading into a prolonged bear market. So this isn't just crypto that's down. This is macro tech and finance right now. People are shook. I was in Audi yesterday and I felt very guilty. So the first thing was, never seen this before. There was a homeless guy at the front of Audi with like a big sign, um, all the stuff he had written on there. And this is an Audi that's not in a big shops. It's just like located like near the pub. And I go in and I'm trying to buy some dinner for my family, uh, something to cook up. And then people in there are like, oh, the grapes are like an extra $3 more than they were yesterday. This is ridiculous. Like we can't buy this. We need to get something else. And not only are people getting laid off, inflation is insane. Like it is so, so crazy. And tying it back to, to crypto, you've got a lot of macro factors at play, but crypto is just a subset of technology and finance. Like if you did that graph, it's just right in the middle there. There's other things, aspects as well, but there's it's just a bunch of technology people and a bunch of finance people and we're right out on the, on the bell curve of insane stuff on the edge of the internet. That always comes back and it will still affect those businesses like, you know, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, all these companies that have been doing really well, revenues being sky high, and you think about where, let's just look at Facebook, where they get their revenue from. So yes, they've been spending big in VR and AR, but they get the majority of their revenue from ads. Who pays for the ads? Businesses. People aren't consuming a lot from businesses. Their ad budget goes down. Facebook's revenue goes down. So all of a sudden, I can't have all the staff that I once had. Same for Amazon. Discretionary spending is down. So if he's got, I think it was like 16%, like the last count. If that goes down 16%, your revenue, you've got to cut 16% of your staff or have very thin margins if you want to, or you want to maintain a certain profit margin. Mm. And again, these big companies, they're listed companies. So they're beholden to shareholders. What do they have to do? They have to be profitable. 
they have to give a dividend and they have to steer the company. And in order to do that, they have to reduce staff because you can only control two inputs. You've got your expenditure mm. and then you've got your revenue, you know, income. If you can't really control income that's going down, you have to look at your expenditure side. And it's across the board. You're spot on. It's tough, man. It's going to be interesting to see where we go the next year. I mean, all these companies are preparing for the worst. You know, I was hearing another, a guy I was speaking the other day, he reckons we could be into a four-year recession based on you know where the, the dot-com bubble burst. So you know, I don't think I'm that bearish, but yeah. man, like well, it's- We are now paying the price for all the cash that was printed. There's too much cash. Mm. There's too much supply over COVID and the years leading up to it. From, right from the GFC, all the cash has been printed in a zero interest rate environment, land and milk and honey, and now we have to pay the piper. And mm-hmm. it's easy to say, but people should have been preparing for this. And it's easy to say because 90% of people don't understand what's going on. And a lot of people mm-hmm. don't have the funds, the income, the situation to be able to prepare for this and weather something like this. So they have to substantially change the situation. It's hard. And even interest rates for like homes have gone up astonishingly i saw an article the other day you need to earn 180 grand to get a five hundred thousand dollar loan with the way that how much living expenses are and to be able to service that loan who the fuck can, first of all who the fuck earns 180 grand out of all of my friends maybe three if that and they're my nba mates that have worked for a long time and they're in their 40s and then where are you going to find a house for half a million dollars uh, those houses just don't exist. It is absolutely crazy. Yeah, yeah no house. <laughs> You're not getting a house for half five. It is okay. so, so crazy, man. Like, yeah, it's full on. That was a bit depressing about interest rates going up, people losing their jobs. All this is, is industries changing. There are still a lot of jobs out there. Yeah, it's not going to be the land of milk and honey for a while, but everything will be fine. It's not all going to hell. We're just paying the price for the fiscal and monetary policies that we implemented during COVID, it's an outlier event. Everything will be okay, kids. Don't stress. <laughs> we'll come back. We'll be fine. We'll, we'll, we will return. Now, Bergs, give us the frameworks. Mate. I know you've watched this documentary. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. You've been frothing oh, over it all week. Give like, us the Okay, beans. so I sat down, I watched a documentary and it's called Stutz. And it's Jonah Hill and his psychologist. And it is amazing. The psychologist is just a no bullshit guy. He's hilarious. And he goes through all these different frameworks and talks through Jonah's life and his own life and how he applies them. And there's this brilliant moment in there where they try to create a movie, uh, a documentary, and he's like, look, this isn't working. I've been dishonest. I've been saying in our therapy sessions, this is happening, but really this is the way. And they have this turning point and they just get through the bullshit onto the good part. And it's just such a kind of, analogy for life and there's a couple of frameworks right so the first one is there's three things that people can't avoid in life and this is pain uncertainty and constant work if you're alive you are going to have those three things and you need those three things for fulfillment and happiness and let's just think about this pain uncertainty and constant work we try to avoid all of those Our idea is the perfect life in general terms is relaxing on a beach and having nothing to do. Like that's what people think retirement is and what they actually want. You do not want that shit. I've had that for periods in my life and it lasted about a month and I was fucking bored as fuck. Like I needed to come back and work on something, build something and have that kind of, you know, serendipity of life, but also uncertainty that this is not going to be a success. So you've got pain, uncertainty, and constant work. And to get through that, you need a series of tools and you must be vulnerable in order to grow, right? So the string of pearls, I've said this about, like the guys at work are so pissed off because I've said this like about 10 times in all of our meetings this week, right? So he says it like this. Basically your job, there's a string of pearls and your job is just to put the next pearl on the string. And after you've done that, you put the next pearl on the string. Great. The challenge here is each pearl has the same weight. No matter what you have to do, I have to go to the gym. I have to get out of bed. I have to have a hard conversation with an employee. You apply the same weight to each pearl and you just execute on it. And I've heard this analogy a lot 
where it's like, yeah, Will Smith's like, I'm just building a house and I lay the brick perfectly and I just build another brick, another brick, and then suddenly I've got a house. The way, the way this is different is, different is each pearl has a turd inside of it. <laughs> and I just love this, right? <laughs> so the pearls, and the simile here is like the pearls aren't perfect. You're just putting the next one on, but it's never going to be perfect. You just keep moving and keep moving and keep moving. And that turd is just to remind you that nothing in your life will be perfect. You just have to get the thing done and you have to keep moving. And honestly, true confidence is those people who live in the uncertainty. And the people that are successful are the ones that work this cycle again and again. You are the epitome of this, Ben. You work that cycle again and again. Like all those tough things, you're like, no, I just have to execute. It's what I need. Yeah, a bit of it's going to be shit, but we keep going and we keep going and we keep going. And that's how you're successful. You'll be so much further down the road than anyone else. And even in the background, you might be able to see my little Jack Butcher um, picture where, you know, the perfectionist just doesn't, you know, doesn't release, doesn't even start. The procrastinator no, goes a little way and then stops. Then the procrastinator does nothing. But the iterator just keeps going along and along and eventually it just goes up. And I thought this was absolutely perfect. So it's not perfect keep moving and really this is what he's talking about it's just a series of habits so you're going to take action no matter what and that could be i wake up in the morning i don't want to get out of bed first pearl get out of bed done and you'd be surprised what that does for you i have to go to the gym just put your shoes on just walk to your car just drive to the gym this is what happened to me when i came to melbourne because i was very anxious about that flight i've got travel anxiety and my wife did this to me where she's like your bags are packed you know just put your clothes on just grab your part, you grab your license, just go to the car, just go to the airport, see how you feel. Just put your bags in, just go sit upstairs, just get on the plane and fucking done. But when you look at everything, you're overwhelmed. So I thought this was absolutely amazing. And so that's like framework number one. <clears throat> the second one was, he calls this the life force. And this was so amazing to me. It's just a little pyramid. At the bottom, you've got your body, then you've got people, then you've got yourself. And this is for you to feel good as a human. And the first one is, what is your relationship with your body? And this just fucking got me. And I was like, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, for you to feel well, are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? Are you exercising well? They're the three things for you to just be okay. And, and this made me go so deep. I had to pause that motherfucking documentary. And this happens within the first five minutes of the documentary. And I was like, my relationship with my body is so poor. Like I just expect it to work. I expect it to be on all the time, but I don't nourish it properly. I don't sleep enough. I don't exercise as regularly as I would like. And, you know, my food's generally okay. And I'm like, shit, that's like the first thing. How can I expect to feel okay and perform at the top of my game if I'm not even doing that? And I was like, holy shit. And then the second one is people. And this was connecting with other people. And he was saying, even if someone wants to meet you for a coffee, and you don't want to meet up with them or it's a business thing or someone that's on the fringe or a friend you, know, you don't really want to see. He's like, do it anyway because you need to connect with humans and those conversations, you get something out of them anyway. Like you get a moment of joy or you just the interaction with humans is what you need in life. That kind of uncertainty, but also connecting. And then the top of the pyramid was yourself. And he said, look, the relationship with yourself and the way you unlock that is through journaling to get your thoughts out get them onto the page see what you're really thinking and that's the kind of hierarchy and if you look after your body if your relationships with people and the relationship with yourself that is your life force and how you look after it. i thought that framework was phenomenal mate like how that's good fascinating, man yeah it, it makes sense like i feel as though when i'm at the top of my game i'm like when i'm working out i'm eating well i'm doing journaling you know i'm not seeing my bedroom all day like i'm going out going to all we work catching up with friends you know in the office whatever it might be like that's the it makes a lot of sense and even like he says when we get down and we judge ourselves by what happened in the last five minutes and we're the worst at this because every human has recall bias and you're like oh this shit thing happened it was really shit and he goes through like a grateful flow and positive thoughts so it gets you to close your eyes and imagine a series of things and it just helps you reframe using that tool about everything else that's happened counterbalance that single point and come to a good outcome and actually think about the totality of what you've done rather than the last five minutes and that emotion 
that you're just stewing in. And I found that phenomenal. He even goes into things like um, loss processing and the potency of non-attachment and radical acceptance. And these things are too big for the pod, but they are just so easy to do. You'll be able to memorize these tools. It is phenomenal. So it's called Stutz. It's on Netflix. Just get amongst it. Yeah, I'm gonna try and get uh, get to that this week, mate. Now it's uh it's question time. I have to. Uh, I, this is so good. So I listened to a Tim Ferriss podcast with Seth Godin, and there's a question that like all the kind of you know entrepreneurs ask all this sort of bullshit. And the question is, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? And everyone's like, oh, fucking revelation! I'm gonna unlock the secrets of the world. I can't fail. Oh, I'm gonna do this. And Seth Godin just framed this so well where he's like, what you're asking is like when you're in school and you ask the teacher, is this going to be on the test? If it's on the test, I'll remember it. If it's not, fuck it off. I've got other stuff to do. And the reality of that question is if I couldn't fail, I'd be a fucking astronaut, son. Like I would be doing some (laughs) wild, wild shit. It doesn't reframe me and I always get poor answers from it. So he put that question in another light and he said, what would you do even if you knew you would fail? And I couple that with the question, what are you afraid to feel? So let's just go at the first question. What do you, what would you do even if you knew you would fail? And I was like, holy shit. And then first question I asked myself, would I be working at Collective Shift? And I was like, oh, here we go. All right, let's say Collective Shift is going to close in six months and it's going to fail. Would I still do it? And the answer for me was yes. And I was astonished by this because I hate failure. (laughs) And I was like, well, why is it yes? And for a couple of reasons, every day I get to work with a team and a group of people that I really like and I like spending my time with. I get to build cool shit on the internet that I get to put out there. And our goal is to get people into crypto and I get to execute on that every single day. Plus run a business and learn heaps of stuff. So even if the ultimate goal is going to fail and I know that upfront, I still want to achieve all of those things. And there is so much value within those things that I still want to do it. And that was incredible revelation for me. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a much better framing of the question. I, for me, it's just got to be enjoying yourself. You've got to have fun. You want to love what you do. And I love Collective Shift. I love getting up and like fighting battles and trying to build products and build solutions and working with an epic crew and getting excited. And then it's all over the next day. And then, then it's all back the next day. You know, it's like, but it's, it's exciting. It's, it's like, wild. yeah, you keep trying, you keep going. You know, things change and it's, it's the thing that I want to do. And it was so reaffirming for me. Well, we wouldn't have started the podcast. You know, we wouldn't have caught up in Melbourne. We wouldn't have, you know, learned how to sell products on the internet. Oh. We wouldn't have done marketing. We, like, It's so crazy. It's so crazy. And have you watched a movie called Arrival? Lad, no. got to watch it. Got to watch it. Everyone out there, watch Arrival. So it's about these aliens that come down and these pods just land and they're not here to kill anyone or anything like that. Well, they don't really know, but they, uh, a linguistic person goes in and starts to decipher how these aliens actually speak. And it takes a very long time. But the wildest thing about this is time is not linear. It doesn't go in one path. It's actually cyclical. So it starts off with, and a couple of spoiler alerts, it starts off with, uh, her her daughter has just died and these choppers come to her house because she's an expert in her area <clears throat> and they take her to the aliens and she starts to decipher it. Time goes by, a year, year and a half. Then she meets a man and then ends up having a kid with her, uh, with him, sorry. And then that kid is the kid that died at the start. And going into that, she knew and realized time was cyclical, but she still made that choice to have that child that would grow up and at 16 years old would have cancer and would pass away. And first of all, the movie's phenomenal. It's got so many kind of things, but this is almost the epitome of what would you do even if you knew you would fail? So having that child for those 16 years and that experience and the time with them and things you could do was still worth it, even if you knew they would pass away when they were 16. I was like, holy yeah. shit. Like that was like, <laughs> oh man. Yeah, the framing of that question and just seeing that through, you know, the experiences and thoughts. This is the other thing as well. Like, do you find like, as you you get older, you have more experiences, you read more books, you watch more movies, you have more interactions. 
it brings meaning to other parts of your life and things just unlock in your head and start to make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I'm like, oh, it's, you just learn more, whether it be about parents, family, life, cultures, sport. I was just in the FIFA World Cup this morning. I was like, this is like, this is a religion. Look at these oh. people in this game. Like Argentina, this is a, they've got a church named after a player. How good. Like it is like, it is literally a religion. Anyway, you just learn more about how the world operates. My mate was telling me about this and you were saying in the UK where everyone went to church every Sunday and that just got replaced with soccer. That's a new church. That's what they do. <laughs> I And yeah. I swear, okay, if we ever have an exit from collective shift and we've got some time off, I'm going to the UK for two months and I'm going to be a football hooligan. I'm just going to drink myself stupid, just get into fights. It's going to be amazing. You can come with me, mate. It's going to be great. Let's say it's a bucket list goal, mate. It's going to be so good. I love it, man. I All right, it. should we get into right, uh, Let's get into meme it. of the week, mate? Yeah. So Let's get it. memes of the week, this was, this was pretty interesting. Um, the memes this week were either ultra spicy or just not spicy enough. So <laughs> I'm going to share a meme here. So this is this is amazing. This is a patch of dirt, a little bit of road, and another patch of dirt. <laughs> and then one side it's got laziness. On the road, it's got random motivation at two in the morning. And on the other side, it's more laziness. <laughs> and this is just the mate, this describes my life so well. Even though I'm working and I'm still doing stuff, I just feel like a lazy dog because I'm probably not doing the things I should, like exercising. What is going on with this road, man? <laughs> how good, how good. It's just a patch of road in the middle of nowhere and random motivation at two in the morning. I'll literally wake up and go, oh, i got to do that fucking thing. And I can't stop thinking about it. And it's like dark and it's really quiet. And I'm like, oh, I could just go to the computer. I could just smash this out. It's going to be so fucking good. And mate, I, I, seriously, I just wake up and I just hammer away. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And I'll get like a day's <laughs> worth of work done in half an hour. It is incredible. And no one's bothering me. It is so good. So I've got another meme as well. I love this. So this is <laughs> this is a dog. He's he's like he's like a, a, a pit bull and he's sitting upright in a chair wearing a bum bag across his shoulder and he looks like a middle-aged man. And the caption is, when you used to be hard as fuck, but now you're a family man. And he's just sitting at the park, <laughs> just looking out. He's got a little watch on. I just love this amount of effort that went in. And then a final meme of the week, what people think Australians are like. And it's a guy fighting like this big giant grasshopper with big claws. <laughs> That's like 10 times as big as him. What it's actually like. And it's the same photo, but he's just calling him to see you next Tuesday. And it is so good. It's like the epitome of Australia. That's exactly what we're like. Oh my God. So good. Brilliant, so good, mate. Mate, mate shall we get on to uh, meal of the week? Meal All right, week. hang on. Let me load this up. So context uh, for me, I went away. I was in Sydney this week on our EO trip, which was phenomenal. We ate so much good food. This was the first night we went to a restaurant called Chin Chin. Uh, I'm not sure if you had that in Perth, Berg. Yeah, I think a, we do. It, it's one in Melbourne. Yeah, one in Sydney. Beautiful man, Chinese restaurant. Um, oh, so I'm not sure if it's Chinese. Actually, I think it's Asian of some description. Anyway, Asian fusion. This was just Asian fusion. Yeah, this was just like the first half. I couldn't get all of it. So uh, on the far left there, you've got pork belly. Oh, uh, with really crispy skin, like sort of juicy on the inside. To the front there, you've got a duck curry, which was just oh. phenomenal. The duck was just falling. I love a the duck bone. curry. Oh. They gave us some um, some some naan bread or some sort of bread to like scoop up the curry. To the right there, you've got some um, some brisket. Like the beef was just like phenomenal, uh, so good. Uh, below there, you can't see it, but we had duck pancakes oh. as well. So we went double dark. Did you have it with Brilliant. like the duck skin and the plum sauce and the spring onion? Yeah, plum oh. sauce, spring onion was all, all in there. Uh, had a nice bottle of red, had some rice. Uh, man, this was just top notch. Um, so this was, yeah, this is a 9.6 out of 10. Holy bags. shit. And you got different types in there. Like you got some Indian food, you've got some uh, Thai food, you got some Chinese with the Siu Yuck. Oh, mate, this looks incredible. So good, mate. If you've never been to Chin Chin Go, mate, this place was buzzing. Oh, it was packed. It. Uh, this looks there, amazing. Son. All right. This is my meal of the week, mate. So oh. this is a, it looks like a tandoori slow cooked lamb over biryani rice. So I go to meet up with my mate in the city for lunch. I'm like, I've got to get out of the house. I'll meet my mate. And he's sitting out the front. <clears throat> and it's a small little place. And we're walking in. He just puts his hand across my shoulder. Just like, he's like, you know, I don't go in yet. He goes, see all the photos that they got of all the meals and all the menu. It's all a lie. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> why are we going to this place? <laughs> so I walk in. 
and I'm lining up at the counter. I'm ready to order. <clears throat> He's like, no, nah, man, you just sit down. I'm like, what are you talking about? And you come, you sit down and he goes, he's just going to ask you chicken or lamb. And I'm like, what do you mean? There's like 500 dishes around and there's like a menu with like 50 things on it. He's like, don't worry, man, don't worry. And the guy's like, like, hello, sir, how are you? And I'm like, good, good, good. He's like, chicken or lamb? And I'm like, lamb. He's like, okay. (laughs) And then like walks out the back and then just comes out with this massive plate. Like this plate was like this big. It was incredible. And the lamb was just falling off the bone. It was delicious. And you had like different sauces as well. They give you like a really cooling like um, tom- like a tomato sauce with it. Give you hot chili sauce. They give you yogurt. And this was just incredible. Like this this was a 9 out of 10. I would eat this every day. This is just happy oh, food, man. delicious, amazing. Highly recommend it. This was in uh, Pier Street in the city. Um, I'll get the name and I'll put it in the show notes. Delicious. Amazing. Cool, man. Uh Last but not least, accountability of oh. the week. How are you, how are you going with your dunking of a basketball ring? Have you achieved the uh, no the dunk? No. So I've got until <laughs> the end of Feb. I, I, I can't even touch the ring. But Ben, Ben, I've run the numbers. <laughs> oh, you done the numbers. You done the numbers. I've literally broken it down into like I'm. He's I'm willing to spend. Sheet. You need to dunk a basketball. And I'm willing to spend sheet. two hours a day on this, which is a lot of time. It's two yeah, it's gonna be 168 day. hours total. But you got to remember, the two hours is like comprised of probably researching how to do it, doing some box jumps, doing a little bit of exercise, whatever it is. I need because I need to lose weight and stuff as well. You know, if you're fat, you're not gonna fly. Hours At the week. moment, you know what I'm like. Have you seen that? I believe I can fly. There's a guy that weighs like 200 <laughs> kilos, and he's running on the court in the NBA. He jumps on a trampoline. He's gonna dunk. Just yeah, yeah, he just face plants. Like he goes nowhere near the ring. That's. Just go through the trampoline, like too heavy for That's the trampoline. That's exactly what I'm like. He doesn't even bounce off the trampoline. He just falls forward. Like he's too heavy, right? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't get enough spring in his step. So I've done the numbers. At the moment, my vertical leap is 39 centimeters, right? So that's how high I jump off the ground from, from right. like so here and then jumping up. To get yeah. to my goal of touching the ring it needs to be a 66 centimeter vertical. <laughs> and to double. dunk is probably another six inches above a 10 foot ring. So 10 foot, six inches. I'm six foot one. It's going to be 81 centimeters. So I have to double my vertical leap. And oh, fuck shit. me, I'm going to do it. Uh, this is in, this is near impossible to achieve. Go on then. Fuck the haters. I'm going to fucking <laughs> do it, son. It is it is crazy. So y- you, know, you know what, listeners? This is a... So I fell in this trap. Right, I fell in this trap of of wanting to be a reader, wanting to be this guy. I set these goals about what I wanted to be, not who I actually was. And here we have the typical tech entrepreneur built like someone that needs to sit behind a desk and not be on a basketball court like yours truly. But Bergs hasn't figured it out yet. So Bergs, you go ahead. I have all the faith. I hope you fucking do it. Your negativity just fuels me, Ben. I've got a fire burning inside me. And you, you got to understand, up, remember, this was a roll-up goal. I don't necessarily want to dunk a ring, but I do want to weigh less. I want to be fitter. And this gives me a reason. Mate, I've even set up a vision board. So when I wake up in the morning, I've got my vision board right in front. So I wake up, it's the first thing I see. Is LeBron James? And Is LeBron James with mate, your head? <laughs> he looks 10 times better, mate. And then I've got it like above my computer as well. So I've got it written there. So every day I'm just constantly wow. reframing. Okay. So every decision I make, I'm going to, do I eat this chocolate? No, it doesn't align with my goal. What do I eat for lunch? Something that aligns with my goal. What do I do now? Do I sit on my fat ass and watch Netflix? No, I go and exercise because that's what I need to achieve. That's what I need to do. So I'm crowding out all the bullshit, all the bugs in your body that like, you know, tickle your brain and go like, oh, you know, you need to eat KFC or something like that. Now, nah, fuck all that shit. I'm going to be so mentally strong on this and I'm going to achieve this seemingly fucking impossible goal. Fuck the haters. Awesome, dude. Right, I'll go on right. that. I'm just winding up. No. I know you get and then the, the thing this week that I'm going to do for myself is go to a float tank and massage. So I got a gift voucher for my birthday mm. and I get to go for a float tank for 45 minutes and then a 90 minute massage. Never been in a float tank, never been in a deprivation kind of tank. Excited to try it. I've heard good things. I'd like to zen out. Have you ever been in one of these? Oh, no. mate. I'm excited. I'll be able to report back next week. Hopefully, I can get a booking. And uh, This is going to be an experience, mate. How are you going with your accountability? You want to be all these things? How are you going? 
You did read a book, though, man. I am, man. It's going... I did read a book. I've been going to the gym four or five times a week. Feeling good. Feeling healthy. Uh, content smashing it. So... Your content game's been insane, man, mate. Man, like a hun- I've hit 100,000 impressions on LinkedIn in the last month. That is... It's that's incredible insane. so so ben's been so funny he just sends these screenshots to me with impressions and i'm like bro what's the context here what platform is this what's going on why is this important whose profile is this but seriously your game has been incredible like on twitter the engagement you're getting and even on linkedin yeah. mate on your like nft post you've had over like a hundred comments from people that we yeah. know it is incredible yeah. and yeah you get and you've only just started you've only been doing this what like three weeks yeah two three weeks so Mate. Yeah, just doubling down, getting the tweets out, hustling, uh, Twitter, YouTube. We had, oh, yes, I did my first YouTube video. They got nearly 1,800 Amazing. views, um, that generational wealth video. So going to try and do another one maybe tomorrow or Monday. Uh, yeah, man. So we, and then we got the pod, doing Nova still. So crushing keep doing that. it. Keep compounding. Just keep adding those pearls on the just string, baby. Get those fucking, get those, get those turds <laughs> on the string. Small turds, mainly pearls. <laughs> awesome, man. What a show. Wicked show, man. Love that. Uh, if you have your friends wanting to know about at chat GBT or AI or whatever, send them this episode. Uh, pass on to a friend if, you, if you're if you loving uh, business, crypto, personal growth. We'd love to have you on the journey. Uh, thanks to everyone for just watching as well. well I had another li- um, listener the other day, Berg's message on Twitter, just how... Saying it's his new favorite pod, which is just so How good amazing. is that to hear, man? Uh, like every time we get that, I'm so like, holy nice. shit, oh my God. I'll run out and show my wife. <laughs> One person likes us, oh my God. <laughs> it's so good, man. It is just so motivating. Yeah, we're loving it. So um, send any feedback uh, or tweet us at, at babybackberg or at Ben Simpson AU on Twitter. Benenbergs.com. We get amongst it. Benenbergs.com for the podcast and you can watch the YouTube videos if you're listening to our podcast and we'll see you again Catch next week. See you guys.